Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast, your weekly dose of knife news and information about knives and knife collecting. Here's your host, Bob the Knife Junkie DeMarco. Welcome to the Knife Junkie Podcast. I'm Bob DeMarco. On this edition of the show, I'm speaking with Justin Burton of War Crown Forge. Justin is a bladesmith I've been following for a few years now, and I'd say what attracts me most about his work is its ties to the past. Justin's knives, swords, and other implements of chaos harken back to the historical, the mythological, and even the fantasy realms, but they always look beautiful, practical, and deadly. It seems obvious from just looking at videos of Justin's work, which is the only exposure I've had thus far, that he is a very accomplished maker and skilled smith. We'll find out what inspires Justin to make these impressive weapons, but first, be sure to like, comment, and subscribe. Hit the notification bell and download the show to your favorite podcast app. That way you can listen on the go. And as always, if you want to help support the show, you can do so on Patreon. Quickest way to get there is to go to thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Again, that's thenifejunkie.com slash Patreon. Justin, welcome to the show, sir. Thanks for having me on. Uh, it's my pleasure. Pleasure is mine. You know, uh, I was uh, kind of uh, cramming on War Crown Forge today, getting ready for the interview, and I saw on Instagram that post of Jason Statham sitting on the stoop of his trailer uh, on the set of Expendables <laughs> 4, uh, pawing some of your knives. How did that happen? Dude, that was that was that's actually a pretty funny story. That was like 16 months in the works. And uh, as awesome as that was, it kills me because um, any maker, I don't care what you're doing or what you're making, uh, you're progress, you're constantly getting better, always getting better, always evolving, always, you know, uh, you know, advancing. And so I had made those blades, like I said, like 16 months ago. And then the post comes out. And I was like, I'm looking at those blades and they just look so terrible to me. And I'm like, oh, no. <laughs> but oh, uh, yeah. I, I had managed. Uh, it was mostly thanks to my wife. Uh, she had gotten in touch with his uh, like one of his uh, personal assistants. And while they're talking, I ended up getting in touch with Jason. <laughs> and I was like, hey, man, I'd love to make you and send you a knife. You know, love your movies. And I sent him like three knives personally that he owns of mine. And then. Yeah, he asked me, he's like, hey, you know, when we're going to be shooting Expendables 4, uh, send me some knives. And it was like so, and then it just like disappeared. Nothing happened. I didn't hear anything for months and months and months and months. Next thing you know, they're like, hey, can you ship some knives to Greece in a week? <laughs> and, and so I like, you know, I, I, I dropped everything and knocked them out as fast as possible. Um, and that's so, to my knowledge, that's him on the set in Greece uh checking out the knives after they'd been received by the prop master and um yeah it was pretty incredible um i don't know i watched the movie i don't know if they actually made it into the movie i they I, they told me they received them they said they loved them yada 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 but i i don't know if they actually made it in the film uh i couldn't mm. i didn't see a bit there but it was really cool that he had them and that he posted about me it was super kind of him uh he definitely didn't have to do that so it was really fun just as a fan of uh his stuff that was cool yeah. for me you know oh no doubt and and i think uh it's a clever way to to have a really sweet knife collection i know for a fact <laughs> sylvester stallone is a knife collector and i know yeah. jason statham's the knife guy in the expendables so yep uh true. no i'm just kidding but uh I, I was I was curious as to whether you actually made dull versions for it, like stage versions, or you just so, sent so I a... asked him. I asked I asked them about that, and I was like, "Hey, you know, you want me to put you know a blank edge on these, you know, like dull them down and everything?" They're like, "No, just send them how you normally would." Uh, we have a prop master here who will take care of them if we need to. So that was wow. <laughs> yeah, that yeah, that, that was something. pretty crazy. Um, yeah, and so like I, I sent them out there razor sharp, but. Yeah. Well, so uh, how did you get into this? Uh, you're, you're, you know, you, you got that, you got your knives in the hands of some, of some uh, big knife collectors, some big stars, but uh, how'd you get started? Um, honestly, I, uh, I, I'm, I'm a really big nerd. <laughs> so I, uh, I, I'm constantly, uh, you know, just waist deep in, 
you know, comic books, fantasy fiction, and stuff of that ilk. And uh, I always wanted to forge and make my own knives and swords. I've been collecting them since I was a kid. And I just never really, you know, buying store-bought ones, I could never find things that I actually really liked. And, um, and so I was like, you know, once I finally was stationary long enough at one point in my life, I was like, all right, I'm, I'm going to try it out and see how it goes. And, uh, and I just never stopped. I've been doing it now, pushing eight years, I think. So, yeah, it's just, uh, I absolutely love every bit about it. It's, uh, it's been fantastic. So, uh, I mean, we'll, we'll find out about how you learned and everything, but first, uh, the important questions, which movies, uh, do you think had the best swords and, uh, <laughs> what inspired you? Um, I mean, I'll, I'll give you a, for instance, when I was a kid, it was Conan the Barbarian. I mean, oh, by yeah. far Co the, the best swords. Conan the Barbarian is great. Um, I, I really liked, so I've always been a massive fan of, uh, rapier style, uh, swords and swept hilts. And so, you know, basically any Three Musketeers movie or Legend of Zorro movie or, you know, all those where they had the basket hilts or the swept oh, yeah. hilts or the small sword, all those different things, which most of those were all made by one dude out of Burbank, uh, Tony Swatton, I believe. <laughs> he, made, he made like almost every movie sword you've ever seen for like the last 20 years. Um, but yeah, it, it, I, I love all kinds. And then I, I think, but biggest, best swords total, I, it's hard to beat Lord of the Rings, man. It's just, oh, yeah. Yeah, <laughs> because yeah, yeah. They, there's, there's, there's a dozen different epic swords made. Uh, Weta Works did amazing job uh, making all the props. And um, they did some really cool, unique stuff. And there was just so many of them, uh, you know, of all different designs and sets, you know. Yeah. And, and uh, you know, as I mentioned up front, I was you are also um, inspired by mythology and you look at Lord of the Rings and there are all these different races in Lord of the Rings with all their different mythologies and different uh, blade designs and stuff like that. That's what's so cool to me about that series. It's so oh. uh, complex. Absolutely. I totally agree with you. 100%. Yeah. You have wildly different structures and setups and lines and flows to, you know, between the elves, the dwarves and the humans and, you know, everything that's, Yeah it's it's hard to be it's hard to beat that movie for like it's just massive representation of like you know anything you could possibly want so. so when you started you just dived right in and went right for forging uh i take it uh how, how did that how what was your learning like early on oh man my learning all right so this is why my number one piece of advice whenever i get asked now how to start is spend the money and take a class Trust me, it'll save you years. Uh, don't do it the way I did it. <laughs> um, no, I had like, you know, a 55 gallon drum filled with charcoal and powered by a mattress blower and was just out there just hammering around on, you know, leaf spring on a piece of railroad rail, which is like how most Smiths seem to start unless they go the class route. Every guy that took a class or paid to learn from some guy, they, they bypassed me by two years, you know, uh, because mm -hmm. that, that first two years, I was just like a Neanderthal, just like playing around in the muck. <laughs> just, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I mean, obviously, you know, it's not, it's not self-taught because if you're, if you're, if you're reading books or you're watching videos, you, you, you know, you're not teaching yourself, you're learning from other people. So um, it was definitely, you know, like I was scrounging, you know, reading anything I could and watching any videos I can. And, uh, but even still, when you don't know what's right and what's wrong, uh, as far as, you know, blacksmithing, bladesmithing goes, uh, you, you all the information, this is a information overload. You know, you don't know who's right and who's full of it. <laughs> right. So, um, so that, like I said, that slowed me down by a easy two years compared to some of the guys I know, um, that are have been doing it half as long as I have been and are better than me because they spent, you know, a couple grand to take a class here and there in their first year. So worth it. I, I would imagine, especially with something like bladesmithing, a lot of a lot of the benefit of having a class and learning from a master smith or someone at least who's been doing it a long time yeah. is that uh with blade smithing, it seems like there is a certain amount of feel to it. Uh, something that you can't quite write down uh, or or quantify exactly. Uh, for instance, a couple of times I've observed 
uh, bladesmiths, you know, going in the dark and checking the color and things like that uh, seem to me like uh, a feel thing that you pick up from being around people who know what they're doing, kind of like a musician uh, would pick up the feel of a song by playing with other musicians. Oh, absolutely. Every, every I mean, you, you can take a hundred smiths and ask them all the same question and <laughs> you're going to, you're going to get 80 different answers. Uh, uh, everyone's got their own little, their own little twist on, you know, you've got the approved method and then everyone just like, well, I tried it. I did it this way a little bit different. Well, I used this instead and I, or I had this, or there was a solar eclipse when I did it. It's, it's, uh, it's yeah, there's, um, everyone's got their own twist on what they think is the best way. Um, yeah, yeah I, I, the, the best, the best advice is test everything and, uh, <laughs> check your results. Yeah. I'd, so do you have any examples of your work that you can hold up right now so that we know what we're talking about, okay. um, as we continue the conversation? So I'm, I'm working on a handful of things. So I have gotten, I have gotten grief about this because I tend not to keep too many of my pieces. I've only kept like, I've got two that I've kept and then I've got some pieces in process. So I got a, uh, this is one I uh, recently finished, which was a, a integral <clears throat> bolster chef knife. Right this there. is not typical for you, is it? That is not. So this one I went and took a class on because it was something I wanted to learn more wow. because I don't do integral bolster knives that often. And it's, as a matter of fact, I'm not that big of a fan of them. I appreciate the talent and skill it takes to make them and I want to get better at them. But it's not something that gets my creative juices flowing, as mm -hmm. it were. But man, it, it's like uh, it's definitely something you need to know how to make if you're going to be you know, bladesmithing. It, 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 they're, just, they're, too, they're too big. They're too popular to not at least know how to make them. Yeah, well, it seems... It se well, first of all, uh, before I get to that, uh, I can see the profile in that uh, sort of echoing some of the profiles of your, like, big bowies uh, that I've seen. Yeah. Uh, but but um, th making a chef's knife, you know, when you held it up and you were kind of turning it in your hand... Uh, you could see how very thin it is. Oh yeah, um, oh, yeah. that that's got to be, you know, especially for someone who's forging swords. And I, I would imagine your swords are quite fine and everything, uh, but but still, uh, I would imagine the chef's knives are are thinner by uh, quite quite a lot. Um, that must be a whole new skill. No, do, doing chef knives, and I, I have the uh, a huge world of respect for the guys that do it like, you know, full time the chef knives or that's their passion. It is definitely not mine, but um, making chef knives is it, it's it's a whole nother ball game because it, it's you know, that's why the S grind is now becoming so popular is because, you know, people have, uh, you know, what they consider to be like an excellent cut is something that doesn't hold. You know, if you slice through a vegetable, it does, they don't want it to stick to the blade. They want it to yeah. fall away. Wait, wait, describe the S grind. What's the S grind? Uh, so, that, so that's, uh, and I may be butchering this, but the S grind uh, essentially is where they take a big contact wheel and they hollow grind in a big swath in the middle of the blade. And then they come in and they grind a flat grind for the primary bevel. And yeah. so that you get this kind of, this, uh, so the idea behind that, I believe, and I could be wrong, <laughs> I'm often wrong, uh, is when you're cutting through some food uh, that it creates that air gap where the food falls away okay. from okay. what you're cutting, like it doesn't stick to the chef knife. So I believe that's the entire purpose of it. And that is another thing that's becoming wildly popular over the last year and a half. Uh, people making those S grinds. They, as a matter of fact, now they specifically sell curved platens for grinders now to do oh, those wow. grinds. It looks cool too. I would imagine. Oh, I mean, I, I'm not sure if, if I've seen that exactly, but especially if it's a mosaic or a uh, pattern welded, you know, Damascus, where it really augments the pattern, uh, you know, the grinding of the pattern to re reveal a um, a look you don't normally see. So yeah, it can look quite fantastic. So uh, before we leave your chef's knife, you're talking about how it's an integral bolster knife. Just describe yeah. what that is and so, how that's um, special. Yeah, so the, uh, you have the integral bolster, meaning that the bolster area of the knife is forged from the same homogenous steel uh, of the bill. As you can see, that it is one continuing piece. 
Uh, this one was like a little special edition because the billets that we used for this in the class were made by the guys over at Baker Forge and Tool. And they had TIG welded these copper Damascus billets on. You can get to see a little bit of that copper on there, uh, which is really awesome of them. Uh, that's cool. Well, uh, so this is not the kind of thing you make ordinarily. What What is the kind of thing you make ordinarily? So the kind of thing I, I really, I make a lot of EDCs. I make a lot of little EDC blades. Beautiful out for Tonto. To, yep, yeah, just a little Tonto EDC. And then the stuff that I love making is something I currently have in process. This one isn't finished yet, but <laughs> I like making Ooh. the big... I like making the big, ridiculous fantasy stuff or, you know, something that's got a little flair of his, uh, history mixed with a whole lot of uh, fantasy in there. Wow. So this, this is a big piece I'm working on. I actually had the privilege recently to go up and forge with um, the guys at Baker Forge and Tool and, uh, and forge some of my own uh, copper Damascus sand mai. And that is what I'm turning it into. I wanted to make something crazy uh, out of it, something something huge out of it. Man, that is gorgeous. I I mean, I am very much in love with that with that profile. Like, I love oh, yeah. a, a clip point. I love a, a a Bowie blade. I love a recurve. That kind of horse hoof handle you're using oh, yeah. there. Um, uh, so I mean, you you describe that as sort of fantasy. Uh, to me, I saw that as uh, well. Yeah, as exotic. I guess they're kind of similar. Yeah, uh, similar yeah. You got you got a little there. bit of a Persian flair to it, and mixed with some other. You know, anytime you take something uh, historical and then make it, you know, you blow certain parts out of proportion, or you make it way hmm. bigger or longer than it was, or fatter than it was. You know, it's you, you change up. You you take away where it was in history, and and you're adding, you know, make believe to it to a certain degree you know you know something you know fantasy oriented i guess <laughs> well i mean it's a little bit like uh your interpretation of the tanto you were just holding up your edc you know it's a it's a broader stouter version yeah. of a of an historical uh knife yeah absolutely i would definitely agree it's uh that's it a little bit so how would you describe your your process? Is everything you make uh, pattern well Damascus? Uh, tell me about how you go about making a knife. Uh, so um, it really depends. So I have, uh, I ha you know, the EDC, it, a lot of it. So I do this full time now. I've been doing it full time for uh, almost two years now. I've been nice. making for almost eight years now. Um, so, you know, you have blades that sell quickly uh, that pay the bills. And that would be these kind of blades, right? You know, your your EDC blades, your everyday carry items, your smaller, like four inch blades or shorter tend to be your your quick sells, uh, what pays the bills. Um, and then you have like the larger pieces. Um, so it, it really depends on what it is, you know? So there'll be, if, if I'm doing a large batch of, of small blades, you'll be doing, there'll be, you know, batches of stock removed blades uh, which is where you're cutting out the shape of a, uh, you know, a knife shape out of steel and then heat treating it and refining it and, um, and then turning it into a functional knife. Um, and then you have the ones that I'm more passionate about, which is when I get, you know, either a large blade or a custom ordered blade and I get to take it to the anvil and forge something out and shape something there and then bring it into, you know, life after the forging process. So... Well, okay. Uh, Jim just had your website up there, and the last shot we saw was of you uh, holding a kopesh. Um, <laughs> and I've seen you. Uh, you make wakizashis. Uh, you made this beautiful gladius not too long ago. That was just oh yeah, that yeah, the tactical gladius. Yeah. <laughs> I mean that uh, that is uh, you know I'm I could justify that easily by saying I'm Italian and I'm buying that as a there you as go. A there you nod go. to my, uh, <laughs> but, but you were mentioning the, the EDCs sell quicker. Those, uh, the first thing that popped into my head, uh, those are the easiest things to justify, especially if of you're, course, of course. if you're, um, learning about a new maker, getting into a new maker, or you don't have maybe as much money to spend on, uh, on something larger. 
Uh, but also you got to justify it to the other people in your life, say your wife, you know, oh, well, I carry it every day, babe, you know, <laughs> or I take it to work um, and then ease that person into the larger. <laughs> there you, you know. go. It's, it's so, the crippling debt of knife collecting. Yes. <laughs> yeah, it is a, an, an ever spiraling. Uh, <laughs> so with the, with the gladius, uh, with the wakazashis, I've seen you make a lot of those. Um, and uh the large kukri, that kind of thing. Are those uh, knives that are short swords and knives that you decide to make on your own because uh, that's just, you know, what you're burning to make, or are these the kind of things that are more commission based? Okay. Well, so the, 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 the modern wakizashi that I make, uh, the battle walk, um, it, it's, it's, it's actually kind of funny. I did not expect those to be as popular as they were. Um, uh, it, it kind of surprised me. <laughs> I was, I, I wanted to make some and I thought, I, and, and how that evolved was I, w I was in my shop and this was years ago and I was in there and I wanted to make a, you know, a, a katana styled smaller blade of wakizashi, um, and, but I, at that point in time, I, I wasn't very, I wasn't very good at doing hidden tangs. I wasn't very good at doing guards. And I, I, I'm, you know, I'm a, I'm a perfectionist when it comes to my stuff within the realm of what I'm capable of. So like doing guards that don't have like perfectly clean fit ups, make me want to slam my head against the wall, you know, so like, uh, so I, I hold myself to such a high standard when it comes to certain things that I'm like, okay, well, I'm not going to do that yet because I'm not good enough to do that yet, I'm going to hold off and build those skills. So what can I make? And so the modern Wakizashi, the tactical battle walk was born because I wanted something really bad that kind of fit that criteria as far as shape, design, functionality, and comfortability. Um, but without having, you know, a 12 piece handle set up, something that someone mm -hmm. could easily have one tactical style handle material and still be have their hand protected, still utilize it and enjoy it. And I made the first couple ones and, and they were a hit. And like, I, like, uh, I've made so many of those. I, I can make those, I can make those blindfolded in my sleep now. Um, yeah. I, I never would have expected them to be as popular as they became. Um, and so now I, I throw in, you know, like the, and so that kind of spiraled me into like, you know, like what other classics that I love, can I make a modern, tactical version of and i've always cook kukri's are my favorite blade shape oh yeah kukri's are by far my favorite blade shape and um and so i'm always trying to find a way to make you know uh either an edc version or a functional smaller version or something just you know crazy big and yeah you know and these are really cool. <laughs> Jim is scrolling through your page and I'm just uh, uh, drooling, I guess I'd say. But uh, do you, you know, you're talking about uh, kukris and making small pocketable versions. That sax is unreal. I love that. That's amazing. Uh, uh, do you find a, um, uh, a, a certain special challenge in shrinking down a kukri? I do. So like I made the EDC kukri and I, I you know, I still make those quite a bit. Uh, I really enjoy them. I, yeah, but I, that, that's something else. So like the, when it comes to an EDC and I always tell customers this too, I, I always tell them, I said, if you're going to, if you're going to spend the money on buying a custom knife and I, I don't care if it's from me or uh, any other maker out there, if you're going to drop custom knife money, get something crazy, you know, get something, get something that you're going to want, because what are we all going to do? A any knife you have, any firearm, anything that you collect, you're, as soon as someone that you're back, dude, look at this. Let me show you. Yeah. Me, exactly. dude, you got to see what I just got. You got to see this. We want to show our friends. We want to show people. Um, so get something, get something gnarly, you know, get something, you know. Yeah. So that's, that's another reason. So I want to bring these blade shapes that a lot of people only buy if they're like, you know, a large version. And I want to make something, like I said, if the EDC is going to sell, on a more regular basis or more people can afford it. I'd love to make something, you know, for everyone that is at least in an affordable size for them as well. You know, if they, if they can't necessarily buy a big, you know, 10 inch blade cookery. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, I've seen you do uh sort of the, well, your small EDC cookery has the ring, right? It oh, has yeah, the, yeah. Yeah. Uh, and then also I saw a dagger, a ringed dagger you make, or uh, it could have been a custom. Or, I mean, just a one-off. Um, but uh, 
doing the ringed things that's a that's a real challenge do you drift every one of those rings how does no god no god no no so yeah my rule of thumb when it comes to making something is is listen if i can forge the original if i know how to forge it if i can competently forge what i'm making then i've got no problem doing a stock to move uh piece uh the ringed pieces actually became and this actually came from some advice from Jason Knight. I was actually, uh, he actually, you know, um, he took me off my pedestal a little bit and I thank him for it. Uh, it, it was a, it was a prideful thing I kind of had in my mind. So I was, I was in his shop talking with him and he, uh, you know, he's just wildly successful at what he does. He's an amazing maker and uh, he's inspired me for years. Um, but I was in there talking, he's like, man, uh, it looks like you're making a bunch of your ring back knives. And I'm like, oh yeah, you know, I, I'm 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 working on them nonstop. And he's like, oh, have you gotten any of the blanks water jetted out? And I was like, you know, I made a face like, no, no, I'm I'm doing it. And he's like, why don't you have a family to feed? Or don't you? <laughs> don't you? He's like, are you growing that big? Could you benefit from having some? And I was like, well, yeah, I really could benefit from having some because I I am boring, you know, I am whole saw cutting out every ringed knife. I am, you know. <laughs> doing yeah. all those just to keep up with just to keep up with orders just to keep up with production and you know i'm just one guy in my garage and um and so and so about a year ago i started you know water jetting out uh you know, just my ring my ring blanks and that whew, gosh that that made it so i had more time to work on you know like passion projects or bigger pieces because now you know anything with a ring on the back, I could just, you know, fulfill that order a lot quicker. So did Jason Knight give you the idea or did he give you the permission? So to speak? Oh, honestly, I knew other people were doing it. It was, it, like I said, it was like a prideful thing. Uh, you know, okay, because once okay. again, yeah, it, it, where I was, uh, so I'm currently out and I live in East Tennessee now. And where I was before that, for like the first six years that I was doing this, I was living in the middle of nowhere in Arizona. And I knew like one other Smith and we chatted occasionally, but there were no other bladesmiths around anywhere near me. You know, I had no one to bounce ideas off of, see what other Smiths are doing, see what other makers are doing. And out here I'm drowning in them. They're everywhere. Oh, I, I, so could, cool. I could throw a stone and hit four. Um, and, and like I said, so, and uh, Jason is, lives real close to me and so it was kind of like having someone that i looked up to be like wow you're being an idiot you know stop being yeah, so yeah. stupid and prideful and i was like oh, well you know maybe i will you know maybe i am being and so i just kind of took a second look at my process and what what i was making and what i needed to do and, and i was like yep yeah, i'm being stupid and yes <laughs> <laughs> or or no one being smarter yeah i mean i i think that that is uh that is that is the typical business model, I would say, at this point, from the people that I've spoken with who are primarily bladesmiths. Um, you know, you have a couple of really in demand models, um, usually the smaller ones that you can kind of make in a more, um, I don't want to say automated because it's not automated. You're just having them cut out and then you're doing, but, but you can, you can have them done quicker, more efficiently. Yeah, in a more production like setup. Yeah. So uh, when you do, uh, um, say, uh, a, a run of uh, kukris with the rings, for instance, what do you call those, by the way? Uh, so the ones with the rings that are kind of a kukri, those that's my Hermes model. Oh, nice. Oh, okay. Uh, so your Hermes model, for instance, uh, if you're going to do a run of those, do you wait for orders to build up and then you do a bunch of them? Or do you say, hey, I'm going to do a, a run if you want in, you have until October or something? Uh, so... I, I'm just now starting to kind of transition into making batches of blades and then dropping them for people to purchase, uh, which is which is kind of new and kind of scary for me because I I normally operated in about a 50-50 uh, market as 50% uh, custom orders that are on my custom order books that I'm constantly working on to clear and the other 50% making a blade and posting it for sale, you know, making one blade and putting it up for sale. And then when it sells, you know, making something else. And so I'd make blades in batches. So I'd have like three or four custom orders on my books and I'd make those simultaneously as like two other blades that I was going to put up for sale. 
And so I'll just be working, you know, back and forth on all five blades until the orders are finished and then push, you know, post the other two for sale. Uh, but just now in the last you know, couple of weeks, I'm transitioning into trying to clear as many custom orders as I can and get to dropping custom batches of blades for people to purchase. What are you expecting that to change for you in terms of uh, being an artist? Well, I mean, knock on wood, I, uh, the, my biggest complaint I get is, Hey, your website sold out. There's nothing on your website. You're, and, yeah. and the reason for that is, is I'm, I'm, I'm caught in like a custom order loop. You know, I'm booked about four months out currently, and I've been booked four months out for the last year, which I mean, that's not a bad thing. That's a blessing, but i am you know, it's just like I, I'm just constantly catching up on orders and never having time. And, and you know, a lot of people, you know, the, it makes them nervous to custom order a blade and wait four months. I get it. Mm -hmm. I understand, mm -hmm. you know, especially if you're new to buying custom knives, yeah. you know, that that might seem sketchy as heck, you know, might see it sound like I'm trying to scam someone. If I'm like, yes, please give me, you know, hundreds of dollars and uh, and then wait four months to hear from me, you know. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I, I want that to be an option for people that if they want to pop onto the website and buy something right then, right now for a reasonable price and not have to wait, then, you know, all the power to them. Yeah. Yeah. And it also makes you a more uh, varied company. You know, it makes you a, 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 a wider ranging, uh, you know, offering. And uh, if you don't get them with the Wakazashi, you can get them with a with an EDC. You know, I think that's yeah. A, there you go. It seems to be a smart way to go about it. Um, so uh, the um, you were in the Navy, I know. Um, thank you for your service. Uh, what? How did that affect your love of knives? It, it, did did that have anything to do with where you are today in terms of knife making? Um. You know, uh, when I was when I was in the military, I, I bounced all around. Um, and so, like, I didn't I didn't start making knives until I had already been out of the military for several years. Uh, so I got out in 2010 and I made my first knife in 2000 and uh, 2016, I think. Oh, OK. okay. Yeah. So it, it was quite a span. And that was because I just I moved around so much. I was like a nomad. I didn't live anywhere long enough where I could build up tool. I, I mean, all everything I owned fit in the bed of, you know, a, a truck. And so like, I didn't have any tools or anything that I could build up to actually start, you know, making a forge to, you know, pr try this out on. And uh, it wasn't until I had moved to Arizona where I was finally stationary long enough where, you know, the wife was like, why don't you finally give it a go? When I was like, all right, we'll, we'll go for it. We'll see what happens. So. God, running a forge in Arizona. Oh I man, mean, I, yeah, I, I'm golden now out here. This is like this is this is easy weather now out here. People are always like, ah, oh, the humidity and everything. But I'm like, have you ran a forge in 125 degree heat? Oh, <laughs> so uh, you start. You said that when you started forging, you were with a 55 gallon drum full of charcoal. Oh and, man, yeah, um, it was so bad. <laughs> so so seeing seeing progress or or works in. Pro works in process videos uh from uh your instagram feed obviously you have uh, seriously uh, outfitted your your shop um what 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 has changed since becoming besides like that kind of thing but what has changed since becoming a full-time uh knife maker um just in in for you in the process oh man it's like it's like getting to be like Willy Wonka, man. I, I every day I get to wake up and I, and I and don't get me wrong. I expect it to all come crashing down at any moment. Uh, <laughs> it's uh, I, it, it's the novelty and blessing of what I have going on right now is not lost on me. Um, it's it, it's unbelievable. I get to wake up. I get to be with my wife and kid and hang out. And then I walk downstairs into the garage and and start doing something i'm absolutely passionate about and uh you know it's always varied because i mean you've got the job or hobby or passion of bladesmithing there's so much varied and involved into it uh, you're not just doing the same you know you, you've got 
handle making and woodworking involved with it. You've got metallurgy involved in it. You've got forging involved in stock removal, design, geometry, grinding. There's a, there's a million little things. And I am so far away from where I want to be skill wise. Like there's, there, there's guys that just make me look like a child. They're so skilled and talented at doing this. And, uh, you know, I'm constantly, you know, uh, you know, I've got a laundry list of things I want to learn and I've been ticking away at it for the last eight years, you know, it's just, and, you know, in, you know, 20 more years, I might get there, but it's, no, it, it's amazing. Uh, getting to, getting to, you know, drop what I'm doing to push my kid on the swing and then go back into the shop and continue grinding a blade. Uh, that's a huge blessing. No, I'm spoiled. Oh, yeah, no doubt. I mean, uh, so I want to take exception to one thing you said, uh, you said, you realize that this is a novelty and it could all come crashing down. I, I totally understand what you mean. Um, it's not too many people who get to live their passion and it's uh, always good to be um, cautiously optimistic about, about anything. But I, I look at it differently. I see um, what you have and what you've built your skills that is and your shop as an eternal skill. That's like something that doesn't go away the need oh. for that you know things everything we have right now in modern uh, society could could uh become null and void but but making blades and knowing how to manipulate metal and harden metal for whether it's knives swords or plows or whatever it is uh always a necessary uh skill needed by everyone all around yeah. no i 100 I agree with you and like you know i always say this is even if this all went belly up tomorrow and I never was able to sell another blade, I'd still be in there making blades in my free time. Uh, I'd, I'd just be selling them, you know, or I'd just be giving them away then. <laughs> I'd, just, I'd, I'd still be, I'd still be making it because I absolutely love doing it. I, I'd, I'd be selling them for the cost of materials just so I could keep making them then. You know, it's, uh, it, it's, uh, I, I've tried my hand at a lot of hobbies and, uh, I was bad at all of them. Uh, this, this is one that I've not only uh, I've taken to, but I, I thoroughly, I thoroughly love it. So, well, I was going to ask you that. Like, have you always been someone who's uh, handy or capable, uh, creative nope. with his hands? No, <laughs> no, well, no, nope. not, not even a little bit. <laughs> No, well then I, how is it you must have <laughs> just lucked into your one no, like, good it's, thing it's listen I, I i i'm definitely uh i know how to do a little bit of a lot of stuff i have wor i have worked and had a lot of different jobs um awesome ones and nightmare ones and uh, so but I'm, i've never been like mechanically inclined um you know, I, you know, I can't, you know, I'm not good at woodworking except for doing a handle on a knife, you know, like I'm not good. You know, I, I don't play instruments. Well, I've got butter fingers. Um, it's, it's, you know, I've tried a lot of different stuff. Uh, it's this just, I think this clicks for me because, uh, I'm such a nerd about it. Cause I, I'm, I'm passionate about the end result. And so, uh, my passion for the end result, it just fuels, you know, pushes me past all the other things that would normally make me stumble. And, uh, you know, makes me uh, look at them. It's, it's like selective learning, you know, it's hard. It's hard. If you're not into math, it's hard to pay attention yeah. to the math class, you know, but if you're yeah. into history, you'll remember all the dates and times and everything, you know, it's, it, it's that this, this, this is my passion. How do you test your work? Oh, so man, that is never ending and always evolving. Uh, but I've done, so, uh, you know, the standard, I guess you would say by the book. So you have the American Bladesmith Society, of course, mm -hmm. and, uh, the American Bladesmith Society has their, um, I think it's, I, I'm not a member of, uh, the ABS, but I, I like what they do for the bladesmithing community. Um, but they have the journeyman bladesmithing, uh, strength integrity test, I believe it's called. I might be butchering that. Uh, but that's basically where they, they, you know, someone who is trying to go for their journeyman uh, certificate uh, portion of it, they have to bring in a blade in front of a master's myth, and they have to like chop through a two by four, then cut through a one inch thick hemp rope, then have it shave hair, then chop through another two by four, then they have to put it in a vise and bend it to 90 degrees without it crack, without it breaking. And, uh, and that is their strength integrity test. Uh, so I've done that numerous times. 
uh, pass, you know, making sure I pass that. And um, also, too, you have the, you know, depending on what steels you're using, you have all the parameters you have to hit for a professional grade heat treat and tempering process. Um, and so for that, you know, uh, a big a big change for that for me was once I got kilns in my shop, I was able to change my and this is this is how most smiths start off. Most smiths do their heat treat using a forge when they start out before they can buy a kiln or afford a kiln or before they bite the bullet and, and buy one. Um, and for most of those people, they can get a relative good, relatively good heat treat, but it'll be nowhere near as good as what they can accomplish with a digitally controlled kiln for doing their thermal cycling and their heat treating and getting all their soak times for a quench and whatnot. It, it makes a world of difference. And so for there, you know, you can do snap and break tests, what are destructive tests to crack open a blade you've heat treated and check the grain structure in there. And uh, yeah, I mean, it's, it's huge. That's, that's a, that's it. That is a deep pool. <laughs> You know, I was wondering, uh, I saw the even, was it even heat kilns that you have? Yes, sir. Um, uh, and, and I was wondering, I, I just from forged in fire and from seeing live demos and stuff, that's where I see the heat treat just coming out of the forge and going into the yep. oil. Um, so I wasn't sure if I was seeing you uh, heat treating uh, a, a stainless stock removal blade. I couldn't tell what I was looking okay, at. No, but... So uh, that, that, the recent one I did, that is just, uh, that is, uh, my thermal cycling for, so the vast majority of, uh, blades that I make, uh, or that you see, I make them out of 80 CRV2. That is a high carbon steel. And, uh, so what I am doing is I am thermal cycling them to make sure that all of the, the crystalline grain structure is all nice and aligned and as it should be, and that it shrinks the grain structure of the steel, uh, because every time you heat it up, it swells. And the more it swells, the more brittle it gets. So if you were to snap the blade open, you know, quench it right there and snap it open, it would look like uh, granules of sugar or sand inside. Mm -hmm. And you don't want it. That's way too blown out. You want it nice and tight and very smooth and satin, like wet cement in there. And so thermal cycling helps shrink that grain structure down. And that's what that was what I was using the kiln for in that post. Okay. So that's the, uh, the sort of the tempering process, but a little bit more complex. Uh, have, have, did you ever, have you ever gotten to the end of, a uh, uh, complicated build or just, you got to the end of something you're very proud of and then it just somehow broke. Oh, Never man. happened. Uh, so, uh, I've only cracked like, I think three blades and, and, and every single time I did it, it was with 1095 steel. <laughs> which oh. is it's which is a which is a finicky steel a uh, lot of people love it um and honestly my heat treating skills are so much better now that i could probably use it no problem but i like i i hate it just because you know i cracked three blades once upon a time with it years ago <laughs> so uh but yes i i you know i've done you know uh, i've done I forged out, you know, complicated bars of mosaic Damascus and started cutting into it and um, and saw that I had like welds that hadn't set, you know, mm -hmm. at, at certain parts of there. And so I was cut like one bar. I was cutting slices off of it and I kept taking them and throwing them on the ground and watching them break apart into four pieces uh -huh. perfectly. And I was just I ended up cutting like four inches off this one bar until I got to perfectly forge welded material which made it, you know, the blade I was going to make was going to be this big, ended up being this big. <laughs> a little slip joint blade oh, there. Oh, <laughs> yeah. Time you're done. Oh, yeah. I've, no, I, any any smith that's putting out a good amount of material has a bucket, or in my case, like the bed of a truck full of, you know, rejects or failures or whatnot. <laughs> well, uh, that picture of the Kopesh, uh, that's that curved egyptian ancient egyptian sword uh if you're not boned up on your historical swords but uh that that very dramatic curved shape uh made me wonder what's the most complicated or difficult uh sword or build uh you've ever done uh, honestly the kopesh that thing was a pain in the 
in the rear, man, that sucker was hard because not only uh, so the customer I made that from uh, for he he wanted because there's there's many different historical shapes to the Kopesh. You've got the big crescent moon. You've got the you know the and then it gets a little bit more subtle depending on like the different kingdoms and eras they had. And that curvature on there, man, grinding that was a was a bear. So this is what a this picture cracks me up. This is one of my buddies. He does this is what he does professionally. He makes like you know uh you know custom posters and things like that. And so he he did that to a picture of of mine. Uh gosh. Uh but no grinding that thing because it was like so rad and so I was just grinding it like I was driving a you know a, an Edsel. Uh <laughs> Yeah, maybe, that, maybe that something better was, than an Edsel. <laughs> no, no, that, it was that big and bony. <laughs> oh, I got you. Oh my gosh. Yeah, and so was that all forged out, or did you cut that out? No, that was forged out. And uh, keeping keeping all that in line for me, it, it was yeah, yeah, keeping that in line for me was uh, you know keeping everything straight because pulling that bar down and then wrapping it back around and trying to get that in there, yeah, it was it was not fun. <laughs> so, so if I, if I'm a, uh, a bladesmith and I'm new to it and I'm starting to spend the money, uh, what is the machine that, or the, the tool that the, uh, in your, uh, equipment that made the biggest difference in your productivity or in your knife making? In uh, general? Honestly, and this is, you know, that's a great question. And I, I, I answer it the same way every time I get asked it, it's, it's buy the nice tool the first time around. Uh, don't do like I did. I bought all the cheap stuff the first time around. So I had to buy twice. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. That's <laughs> but, not good, <laughs> but buy buy a nice, good, expensive two by 72 belt grinder. Uh, because it doesn't matter if you are the best forger in the world. If you are, if you are the best bladesmith in the world and you forge your blades to 99% complete, if you can't grind well, no one's going to look at what you made. Mm. No one's going to want to buy it. It's not going to look good. So, I mean, so honestly, grinding is one of the most important skills because that that's going on everything you make. And if you don't have a good grinder, so the, having a, 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 a crummy grinder and a good grinder makes a world of difference. You can ask anyone, anyone like, hey, hey, what was it like once you got your first nice two by 72 belt grinder? They're like, oh, my gosh, it changed everything. You know, it made everything yeah. so much better. Yeah. Well, what about for uh, a forger, uh, a bladesmith? Uh, what about the power hammer? You know, honestly, I think I think, and and once again, I was one of those guys. I, I thought I got to get a power hammer. I got to get a power hammer ASAP. I got to have a power hammer, and I've used them. I love them. If you've got the shop space for it, and if you have the money for it, go for it. All the power to you. You'll love it, and it'll be a wonderful tool in your shop. But Coal Ironworks changed that for so many people. So Coal Ironworks makes the hydraulic forging presses, and they corner the market on those. They have a beautiful design, and they make them in all these different uh, strengths, like three different, three or four different models now. And they're pretty affordable. You can move them around on casters around your shop. They don't take up a big footprint, and they're pretty darn quiet. And that's all I use. I I I I don't you know I have a small little two car garage. I do everything out of. I, I don't have the room uh, for a power hammer. Okay, wait, wait. Uh, so this press is. Uh, uh, you're talking about. I, I'm going to refer to forged and fire again because that's my that's my most detailed context. Yeah, for I got you. I got you. Forging. You know how uh, they they pull out that that stick of butter, all those uh -huh. different uh, yep. uh, layers, and they put it in and they press it slowly. Yeah. Uh, yep. Before they start pounding it out, is that what you're talking about? That kind of machine? Yeah, that's a hydraulic forging press. And like okay. I said, the, the, comp the different company different from a hammer. Yeah, different from a hammer. And that and the company's called Coal Ironworks. And if you pull them up, you'll look like the, every every single bladesmith in the United States knows exactly who they are, uh, because they're like they're the Kellogg's of that brand. You know, <laughs> every everyone knows who they are, and they're super nice people, and they make every 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 guy's got one that has a smith. Every master smith has got one in their shop. Every <laughs> no, they're they're like the first big expensive tool that most people buy nowadays. Okay, so. okay, because that really eliminates uh, the time of like trying to set the welds. Oh uh, yeah, of all no, those different. I, 
Oh yeah, Is for right? forging Damascus steel, it's it's wonderful. Especially like I said, especially if you can't afford a power hammer or you don't have the room for it, or even if you have the room for it, if you're in a residential area oh, and, yeah. and you can't be like, you know, causing a big ruckus, you know, it's oh yeah, they're wonderful. They're they're worth every penny. Wow. Well, okay, so as you um, you know, you continue uh full time. Well, actually, uh I, I wanted to ask you before I even get to that, what is War Crown? How did you get the name and what does that mean? What's the significance? Uh so that is a uh <laughs> So I, I'm a, uh, I am, as I said, I'm a big fantasy fiction nerd and my, one of my all time favorite authors is R.A. Salvatore and R.A. Salvatore wrote a book series called the legend of Dritz. The legend of Dritz has about 40 plus novels involved in it now. And a very small literary character is a dwarven King in one of those books. He's in there for about a paragraph. And his last name is his last name is War Crown. And I remember reading that and I read those books all the time, uh, reread them all the time. And I was like, that's the coolest name ever. And so when I was first coming up with my names, you know, you know, harking back seven and a half years ago, I was going through every realm of mythology trying to come up with a good name because my name's Justin Burton. I've got the, the only name more generic than mine is John Smith. So <laughs> I couldn't, you know, there's, there, there's, there's Burton knives, Burton cutlery, J ball blades, JB blades that mm-hmm. my name's useless for, you know, brand recognition. And, um, and I didn't want to put a big JB on my blades either. And, and so I'm like, okay, what am I going to call my business? And so I went through all of Greek mythology. I went through all of Norse mythology. I, <laughs> I went through them all. And, and then I'd research them and I, I Google and I, I mean, there's, there's a dozen Valhalla forges and there's, there's a, there's a, <laughs> yeah. there's a, you a know, Norse, Norse mythology is tapped out a thousand times over Greek mythology close to it. And, yeah. and then, you know, Roman, so on and so forth. Like I said, I delved into darn near everything. I even went into like, you know, I was going into like, you know, Pacific Islander mythology and everything. And I was like, all right, none of this is going to work. And so I was like, I was reading that book and I came across it again. And so I emailed Ari Salvatore and I'd never expected to hear from him, but I was like, Hey, my name's Justin Burton. This is what I'm doing. I'd love to name my shop after this small character in your book. And about a week later, he emailed me back and he's like, I'm honored. Go for it. And I was like, (laughs) I was like, all right, let's do this. (laughs) Wow. Yeah. I was going to say what a, what an honor, especially for someone, uh, for whom uh, swords are, you know, probably play big in those, in those books. I would oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Huge, huge. You know, that's, that's gotta be really cool. Oh, yeah. Uh, yeah. They're all based in the Dungeons and Dragons realm. And, um, yeah, to him emailing me back and giving me the go ahead was, uh, was a, was awesome. And that's also too, a big thing. So every once, every once in a blue boot, I'll have a customer that's like, oh, hey. You're an Ari Salvatore fan, <laughs> and they and they know it right from the top. There, that's that that always cracks me up too. Well, who who is your customer? Who do you find uh, buys your work the most? <sighs> Man, well, I'd say the Battle Walk tends to be, like I said, as of as of the last year, the Battle Walk's probably been my most popular blade, and I have made those for a lot of veterans and active duty military. <clears throat> Uh, so there, there, I I get a fair amount of veterans and active duty military, uh, um, more than I have any right to, <laughs> and uh, and so I, you know I I you know I've done I've done them good, I treated them well, and they you know word of mouth uh, spread, and I get a lot of friends and family from those interactions as well, uh, and so that's that's huge, you know I you know that's once once again with there being so many options out there it's it's a huge blessing to to be chosen or to be picked or to have the customer base i do i'm i'm very blessed do you ever hear uh, uh from you know from your customers about reports from the field uh not you know i use my wakazashi in battle but like uh do you ever uh hear of people using your knives out uh on duty or in the field so i have gotten several pictures you know lots of hunters uh, you know, I've cool. got lots of pictures of hunters using them, especially in Arizona for elk. And, um, and then I've got received several pictures of, uh, some of my blades in country in places like, uh, Afghanistan. 
and uh, uh, places of that nature, uh, which is pretty awesome. And um, I, I mean, I think that's about it. Uh, everything else is just more run in the mill, like, you know, camping photos or whatnot. And that's actually something I've done that in the past, uh, but I'm planning on doing that again, which is uh, another knife giveaway. And the only way to enter it is to post a picture of your Warcraft Forge blade, you know. Which, which I think is fun. Just kind wait, of wait, wait, wait. your what your work around forge. What's that mean? Oh no no no! My uh, your war crown forge blade. Oh sorry, your war crown little... forge yeah, blade. I'm sorry. I, yeah I, no no no. You're fine. I misheard you. Uh, oh man. Well, that means I couldn't enter because I don't have one <laughs> yet. Yet. Uh, uh, so in terms of war crown forge, the company, um, how would you like to see it grow? What? Are you ever, do you ever plan on bringing other people in on this or is this a sole authorship uh, project? Uh, so I actually have, so a batch of blades I'm currently working on right now. I am working on them with a friend of mine. Um, so I've had numerous people want to be interested, you know, interested in coming into the shop and working with me. Um, but, you know, the either the chemistry is not always there or some people don't realize how hard of a, you know, how much work it actually is. Mm-hmm. Um, which I, I totally understand, you know, it's not for everyone, you know, and, uh, but I have a guy in the shop with me currently, and we've been working on this new batch of blades that's getting ready to drop here in the next few days. And everything's been going really well, working really harmoniously. And so I've got, I've got high hopes for that because if that works out, then I can, I can knock out my custom orders list and then I can get on to what is kind of my dream for War Crown Forge, which is, blades available you know on the website all the time drops you know special edition drops you know going like once a month or once every two months and me just getting to make like crazy swords and (laughs) and uh and all kinds of stuff because i've got in my brain now after doing the tactical the the battle walk and the tactical gladius i really want to make the like tactical you know ranger sword from lord of the like what if aragon was an army ranger <laughs> right 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 <laughs> i've got so i've got so many more things i want to make and i just don't have time for it, so i need the time oh man well okay before i let you go the uh something that you made was i mean it was so impressive that big giant double bit battle axe uh tell me about that and and it it almost when you did a uh you put it posted a video rope testing holy (laughs) mackerel it looks like it was spun you almost all the way around tell us about this thing uh so this sucker is crazy and ridiculous and it was i had a customer reach out to me and um they wanted a giant battle axe for uh to hang up in their podcast studio (laughs) and i told them and i was like i was like they were like it doesn't have to be functional it doesn't have to be functional it doesn't have to work it's going to hang on the wall and I was like, I can't send something out that's not functional. You know, I was like, I was like, I'll tell you what, like, here's the difference. I was like, first of all, this, these are not historically accurate unless you were like, you know, a headsman in Europe, you know, a headsman in Europe in like the 1400s. You know, that's the only time you would have seen an axe like this. Right. And I was like, all right, these axes are not meant to split wood all day. They'll take limbs off all day, but they're not meant for split wood all day. And so that's what I ended up making uh, that individual. And, um, you know, as the rope cut test, I did the rope cut test and it would you know, slice. It's razor sharp. It's dangerous. It's a ton of fun, <laughs> though, uh, it, for being giant, oversized and ridiculous. Uh, it's pretty balanced and fun to uh, <laughs> fun to it's wield beautiful. around. It's like straight out of a Boris Vallejo uh, uh, illustration. Uh, so. Uh, as as uh, as we wrap here, uh, leave us with your knife making philosophy encapsulated in one small tidbit. Oh, oh well, that's real easy. Better with every blade. <laughs> Better with every blade. Yeah, I love it. No. Justin, thank you so much. Justin Burton of War Crown Forge. Thank you so much for coming in. And well, you didn't come in anywhere for <laughs> for talking with me here. It's been really uh, cool getting to know you. I've I've been loving your work. I like your videos too. I just like the way you present them. You're always, you know, you come up to the camera, you show your work <laughs> off. You can see what you're selling, and uh, man, it looks so good. So I look forward to getting behind the wheel of a War Crown Forge knife sometime in the future. Thank you so much for coming on. 
thank you so much for having me. Honestly, it's been a pleasure. Take care. Do you like the sound of the alphanumeric combinations M390, 204P, and 20CV, but bristle at 8CR13MOV and AUS-8? You are a knife junkie. Probably worse. There he goes, ladies and gentlemen, Justin Burton of War Crown Forge. Uh, do yourself a favor and check him out on Instagram at War Crown Forge. Uh, you can see these things we were talking about, the Tactical Gladius, uh, the the Wakizashi, and all the other cool stuff he makes. Uh, really, really beautiful stuff. Uh, be sure to join us on Wednesday for the Midweek Supplemental and Thursday for Thursday Night Knives at 10 p.m. Eastern Standard Time right here on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch. For Jim, working his magic behind the switcher, I'm Bob DeMarco saying until next time, don't take dull for an answer. Thanks for listening to the Knife Junkie Podcast. If you enjoyed the show, please rate and review at reviewthepodcast.com. For show notes for today's episode, additional resources, and to listen to past episodes, visit our website, theknifejunkie.com. You can also watch our latest videos on YouTube at theknifejunkie.com slash YouTube. Check out some great knife photos on theknifejunkie.com slash Instagram, and join our Facebook group at theknifejunkie.com slash Facebook. And if you have a question or comment, email them to Bob at the knifejunkie.com or call our 24-7 listener line at 724-466-4487 and you may hear your comment or question answered on an upcoming episode of the Knife Junkie Podcast. Knife Junkie.